Good morning. How lovely to see you all this morning. A sunny day, but whether it's going to rain and thunder later, promised it. We want the rain, but uh, perhaps not the thunder. But uh, here we are on Father's Day to come and worship Almighty God, our Father. Welcoming um, Richard Watson, who's our Rural Dean, to come and speak to us this morning. You'll find out more about him in a minute. And so we're going to start this morning's service by singing um, a song, um, because it's going to tell us that the reason we've come is we've come to worship every single bit of what we do. And as I prayed earlier, even the notices are to worship Almighty God. So let's stand and um, sing together. Because you are your, our God. We can come before you because we've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. And we are saved. We can worship you because you've given us your Holy Spirit. Come and fill each one of us. That every portion of this service will bring you glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Please sit down. So, Richard. Thank you. <laughs> so, Richard has come, uh, leaving his own church, St Saviour's, yep. in St Albans. And he's come to us because Caroline asked him. And also because he's our rural dean. I am indeed, yes. What's one of them? A rural dean, um, it's sometimes referred to as a rural dream, oh, uh, okay. depending on how otherworldly we are. But it's a very ancient uh, medieval title for a uh, kind of area minister. So uh, depending on what the issue is, the rural dean is either the shop steward for the clergy or the foreman for the bishop. 
Uh, so so I, uh, yeah, my job is partly to, to make sure that all the churches in the St Albans Deanery um, are well resourced doing what they should be doing. Uh, important things like signing the register, which I realised I need to ask about before I go. Uh, but also um, looking after the clergy on behalf of the bishop, making sure that they're, they're being looked after by their congregations and that all is well. So it's sharing the bishop's oversight uh, and doing part of the bishop's job on a more local scale. Good, so he's and keeping done, an eye I've done on it us before. today. I used to be rural dean in Barnet years ago, oh, right. uh, and I thought I would escape this time. Oh. I was hoping lightning wouldn't strike the same place twice. <laughs> you must have been good at it. Well, on, <laughs> my, it's one of those jobs you get when you don't step back quickly enough, but uh, <laughs> don't tell the bishop I said that. <laughs> He might be watching. He might oh, no, be. But he's busy, isn't he? But anyway, um, so uh, being Father's Day, I wondered whether you're in that blessed position. Of being I am indeed. So I've been married to Linda for 34 years and we've got three children. Uh, our eldest is 32 uh, this year. That's where you, you'll say to me afterwards, I'm sure you don't look old enough to have a, a son who's 32. Uh, he's an animator. Uh, he works on Marvel films and things like that, based in London, lives just behind St. Catherine's Dock. Uh, and then Rosie uh, is our middle one, um, and she's a, she works for an eco-energy company. She lives in Hartford, um, and she's got a, a whippet called Reggie. Uh, I'm from East London, so we were very tempted to get another whippet and call it Ronnie, so that we had both. Uh, I'll tell you about my family connections with the craze another time, that's a long story. Um, and then our youngest is Luke, he lives in Cheltenham and he's currently working for Daya Brewery, uh, which is a real gift to me because uh, I get boxes of free beer sent to me. We run a beer festival at St Saviour's and Daya are donating a cask this year. So, uh, And he's planning at the moment with his girlfriend to do a year in Australia from the autumn. Uh, and we're just bearing in mind that most people who do a year in Australia come back 10 years later. So oh, we're, we're stealing ourselves for that. <laughs> and will you be doing anything with them this afternoon? Uh, yeah, well, I'm going into London, uh, which is really, really helpful because there are no trains to London from St Albans. Uh, but luckily, Cornel, who's my colleague at St Saviour's, uh, lives in um, Whetstone because his wife is a, a minister there. So I'm going to be jumping in his car as he goes home uh, and he'll take us in. And then we'll have a two hour journey back on the rail replacement bus. Later. Have fun. <laughs> okay, and hobbies, do you have any? Uh, cooking, uh, reading. Um, I like to read a lot. On my, my day off, I quite often will have friends and members of the congregation coming around for dinner. Uh, so my ideal day off is to spend the morning checking the internet and the old-fashioned books, trying to find a recipe, going out to uh, the town and buying the ingredients, coming home and getting told off by Linda because all the ingredients I've just bought were in the cupboard anyway, but I hadn't <laughs> checked. Uh, and then cooking the meal and sharing it with friends. And uh, yeah, so I think that's probably We might get invited one yeah. day then. <laughs> oh, well, thank you very much. Pleasure. And we're going to hear from you later. Thank you very much. So that's uh, one person's Father's Day. Some of us uh, celebrating the Lord our Father here, but there are some gentlemen here who might value a chocolate. And um, so I think I spot quite a few little ones. So if I can have all the children and young people to come down to the front, please. It's nice, I promise. <laughs> Only one person wants to do this job. Good for you, Nathan. Come on then, darling.
as well. We're going to sing in a minute, so perhaps wait to eat it till you finish singing. I saw you. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. The men might get two at the end. How are we doing upstairs? Did you manage to get one? Yeah, but I'm sorry, those of you at home, you have to do your own. <laughs> I, I'm afraid I can't ping it through the camera. I can try. <laughs> Don't want to break the camera. Lovely. Thanks, my helpers. <laughs> Lovely. Okay, so all of the young ones are going to go out to their groups now. So uh, the young children, and I don't think we've got any older ones today, have we? So um, I think some of them are away at the 267 weekend, so, which is lovely. So let's pray for all the children and young people. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have got families who are able to come here to worship you. I pray your blessing on them now and their leaders as they go over. Teach them something more about you today. In Jesus' name, amen. So have a lovely time. It looked fun. I went over and the hall's set up. It looks great fun. So if they all had one, they're allowed to... The youngsters can have a sweetie. As they go. So let's the rest of us stand and worship the Lord together in song.
moment of thinking of that time when we know that God has been faithful and has been so good to us. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we've each come to you with things in our heart that we know that you have been good to us. And I'm so grateful, Lord, that you want to be my father, that you sent Jesus as your son to die for me so I can stand here in forgiveness. And thank you that you are our friend. What a blessing. Lord, fill us afresh that we will worship you as you deserve. In Jesus' name, amen. Please sit down and Andrew is going to continue with our intercessions. Let's pray. <clears throat> this Tuesday is the U UN's World Refugee Day, so we're going to start by praying about refugees and migrants. Jesus, you were a refugee child, fleeing from the murderous intent of King Herod. God of love, you are the God who takes the side of the oppressed. You are the God who is close to the brokenhearted. You are the God who raises high the humble. We pray for refugees around the world, May they be welcomed with open arms. May their needs for food, shelter, clothing and love be met. May their wounds, emotional and physical, be healed. In Jesus' name, amen. We pray first about the terrible migrant boat tragedy off the coast of Greece, where hundreds are still missing and at least 80 have died. Father God, we pray you would comfort and hold close those who've lost family or friends and those still waiting to hear about missing loved ones. We pray their uncertainty will be resolved very soon. We pray for the Greek authorities as they investigate what happened and that the right lessons will be learned for how they respond to future migrant boats in difficulty. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for Tear Fund, Open Doors and other organisations around the world as they welcome, support and empower refugees. We pray for governments as they determine and implement policy about refugees and migrants. Please guide them in their decisions about this issue where there are no easy answers. And we pray for those who've left Ukraine as a result of the war there. Please strengthen and support them as they continue to settle into new countries. We pray families who fled leaving behind loved ones will be reunited. We ask, Lord, that you would guide those considering whether or not to return to Ukraine. And we again cry to you for an end to this unjust war. We pray for peace and a Russian withdrawal. Lord, in your mercy. Lord Jesus, we continue to pray for all those facing public exams this summer, especially those known to us. As they approach the end, we pray they will look to you for strength and they'll be able to do their best in their remaining exams. Lord, in your mercy. We again give thanks to the safe arrival of James. Lord, we ask Caroline would recover quickly from the birth and that James would stay healthy. Please give Caroline and Michael wisdom and stamina as they adapt to parenting. And Lord, thank you that you are with us as we father, for you know us, love us and care for us. May we as fathers learn to rest in your care and to lean on you as we give out to our children. May we know your peace in the chaos your truth in the challenge, and your hope in the hardship. And we lift you, Mike, and the 267 team on their weekend away with years 6 to 8 at Felden Lodge. Please, Father, would you inspire all those leading, and we pray that each young person there would experience your presence and love for them and take new steps of faith. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. And lastly, in a moment's quiet, let's lift to God those we know facing illness, bereavement or any other difficult circumstance.
Jesus, would you pour your comfort, hope and healing into those we've mentioned in our hearts and bring others alongside who can encourage and support them. Lord, in your mercy. And finally, let's draw all these prayers together in the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. This morning's reading is taken from Mark chapter 11, starting at verse 20. This can be found on page 1016 of the Church Bibles. In the morning, as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look! The fig tree you cursed has withered. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what, what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lord God, open our ears, our eyes, and our hearts that we may hear and receive your word, even Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, it's great to be with you this morning. Greetings from the deanery. So from here all the way up to Brickett Wood and spreading out around St Albans. Uh, so I bring you greetings with my rural deans hat on, except uh, rural deans don't get a hat. Uh, but also greetings from St Saviour's, where I've been the parish priest for the last six years and where the clergy dressing up box is second to none uh, just to make up for the fact that I don't have a hat. So you'll appreciate that to be here uh, to do things in St Mark's way is quite refreshing and it's also a huge relief not to have to dress up like a Christmas tree on a humid and warm day like today. I'm pleased to be at St Mark's. I'm also really pleased to be preaching from St Mark's Gospel because it is my all-time favourite and it is my go-to gospel of the four. It's certainly the earliest of the gospels to have been written. It's the shortest and it's the punchiest. And it's the one that's so close to those early Christian communities as they uh, grew and flourished in the wake of the resurrection. And although in some senses Mark's version is the simplest of the four gospels, it's by no means simplistic. In fact, Mark is cunningly clever as he organises his material, telling the story of Jesus. And although the passage we've heard this morning is not a long one, there's an awful lot going on. There's faith that can move mountains, there's the assurance of prayers answered, and just in that last succinct verse, that clear teaching from Jesus on forgiveness. Forgive if you have anything against anyone so that your Father in heaven may also forgive you. But of course it starts with that slightly odd incident of Jesus and the disciples walking past a fig tree that Jesus has previously cursed and has since withered. And all of that goes on in just five short verses. Now I'm sure like me you will have your hobby horses. 
things that niggle you, things that rile you, things that no matter how many times you do it, you can't resist pointing out to other people why it bugs you so much. Well, I have to confess, one of my bugbears is the way we read scripture in church in the context of worship, because it's so often unhelpful. Whether we use a set lectionary or follow a sermon series, because we cut scripture into neat chunks and we inevitably regard it out of context. And sometimes that means we miss the point. Sometimes it takes us down a theological rabbit hole that we wouldn't have gone to otherwise. And today's passage from Mark chapter 11 is a case in point. Because Mark is very, very deliberate in the way he organises his material about Jesus. So we can't really make sense of it unless we've read what comes before. So let's backtrack 20 verses to the beginning of chapter 11. I'm not going to read it all to you, but I'm going to sum it up very briefly. Chapter 11 begins as Jesus and the disciples are approaching Jerusalem. And he sends two of them ahead of him to go and borrow a donkey, as you do. That's then followed, of course, by his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And then the crowd welcome him with loud and enthusiastic cries of Hosanna. Note that the next verse, verse 11, probably gets missed out from our remembrance of Palm Sunday. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went back to Bethany with the twelve. So Jesus didn't go straight to the temple. He went to the temple. He didn't start causing havoc. It was the end of the day. He was tired. He went back to Bethany and saved it for the next day. Hands up if you've missed that in your remembrance of Palm Sunday. Yeah, most of us, because we, we remember those Sunday school uh, Bible story books and we used to get stickers at Sunday school with a picture of the story on it and of course we remember in our mind the dramatic bits but we forget that actually Jesus arrived. we don't know if he changed his mind he may have intended to go to the temple and cause havoc uh, maybe he's just thought oh I can't I can't be doing with any more today I'm going home or maybe it's what he observed and then reflected on which is what led him to the next day we don't know we can only speculate but it's interesting the bits we forget and the bits we don't notice. So it's the next day that Jesus heads back into the city and on the way to Jerusalem, that's when Jesus first clocks this fig tree. Now Mark tells his readers that Jesus is hungry. And so even though it's too early in the season for fruit, Jesus goes to the fig tree and looks hopefully for some figs and then seems to get rather cross that they're not there. So what seems to be a fit of peak, Jesus curses the fig tree and basically says, well, if you won't give me any figs, you're not going to give anyone else any figs either. And then, maybe slightly grumpy, then he goes into the temple and turns out the traders. It's not actually the cleansing of the temple. And when we call it that, we misunderstand it completely. It's not a cleansing, it's actually a symbolic destruction. Jesus, in his spirituality, in his preaching, and in his action, was very much in the same tradition as the 8th century prophets like Amos and Hosea and Ezekiel. And one of the things that was notable in their ministry is that they acted out the word of God. They did some very bizarre things to demonstrate how God wanted to speak to his people. And Jesus goes in the temple not to cleanse it, not because he doesn't like the fact that there are money changers there, but because he's symbolizing, acting out that point when the church, the, the temple, will be destroyed. Then the next morning is where today's reading picks up. At last, I hear you cry, we've got to today's passage. But before we move on, we need to see exactly what Mark has done and often does in his way of presenting the story. Because he's taken this story of Jesus seeing and then subsequently cursing the fig tree and he cuts it in half 
and makes it into two parts. A bit like slicing a baguette. And the filling that Mark puts in the middle is this symbolic cursing and destruction of the temple. Now, there's not time for me to tell you about other instances in Mark's gospel where he does the same thing, taking one story, cutting it into plonking something in the middle. You'll just have to trust me on that, that it happens. And it's one of those things that's distinctive about how Mark uh, delivers the story. But by sandwiching together the tale of the fig tree and the symbolic destruction of the temple, Mark is saying something very strong and powerful about the ministry and purpose of Jesus. Why on earth would Jesus expect figs to be found too early in season? Well, remembering his link with the 8th century prophets, if we look in Hosea chapter 9 and verse 10, the patriarchs, the founding fathers of the Hebrew faith, are described as being like the first fruits on the fig tree in the early season. And I think what Mark wants us to realize is that when Jesus enters the temple, not on Palm Sunday, but the day after, he sees just how far God's people, and especially the religious leaders, had drifted from their faithful forebears. And Mark wraps these two instances together, the fig tree and the temple, so that one is able to help interpret the other. So it's against this backdrop that we can begin to understand the reason and thinking behind today's passage from Mark 11. Jesus symbolically shuts down the temple and Mark gives us that imagery of the cursed, fruitless fig tree to demonstrate in real terms what that actually means. People have stopped listening, have been drawn away from the truth they are called to uphold. So Jesus, in the teaching that follows, which forms the theme of today's reading, Jesus outlines to them exactly what needs to happen in order to stop the rot. And quite simply, it's faith and forgiveness. And yes, we've spent a while getting here, but we've got to the theme. Faith and forgiveness. Faith in God, rather than in the mechanics of keeping the religious show on the road. And forgiveness. Understanding that the relationships we have with each other ultimately shape, for good or ill, the relationship we have with God. Elsewhere in the Gospels, when Jesus was asked to summarise the commandments, to say which were the greatest, he whittled them down to two. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbour. And as the first letter of John asserts so clearly, we love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God and hate their brother or sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this, those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. Now if, as I believe is the case, Mark would want us to consider Jesus' call to faith and forgiveness using the fig tree in the temple as our touchstone, as our template, then this morning's short passage presents us with a simple yet very clear challenge. Firstly, where is our faith truly focused? Is it on God? Because if it is, then we really can do anything in his strength. Or is it somehow focused on the external trappings of faith? The day-to-day, week-by-week concerns of running the church and keeping the religious show on the road. 
And do we really recognise how easy it is to kid ourselves that one is really the other? And then secondly, how deeply are our relationships marked by forgiveness? To use that old image, if you as a Christian were a stick of rock and you were broken down the middle, what does it say written through your core? Because in Mark's mind, and according to what Jesus teaches his disciples, it should perhaps say forgiveness. Giving and receiving forgiveness to and from others is that one thing which opens the floodgates of our understanding and our grasp of the forgiveness God offers to us. God's forgiveness is never withdrawn. It is never diminished. But an unforgiving heart can obscure it and can ignore it. So two simple challenges, simple questions, just for us to prayerfully consider in a few moments of silence before our worship continues. What is the real focus of your faith? And who might you need to forgive in order to know more fully the love and the forgiveness that God offers to you this morning. As we ponder those questions, um, let's just as we're sitting, join in with this um, song, I lift my eyes up to the mountain, as we prayerfully think about our response to those questions.
is the real focus of our faith. And that might seem strange. How can I do that? How can I put you first, Lord? Where does our help come from? It comes from the creator of the earth, from our Father. As we sing this again, let's remember that we can only do this in God's strength through his Holy Spirit. those words let's hear what Jesus said therefore I tell you whatever you ask for in prayer believe that you have received it and it will be yours amen let's continue praising the Lord
Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you've given us and we pray, Lord, for these gifts and others given our time, energy and money, that they will all be put to your purposes and for your glory. Amen. Please take a seat. So a couple of notices. Um, next week, um, 267 would like us to do what they're calling a sponge raiser. And uh, they would like us to bake and bring the cakes. And then those of us who can't bake need to bring some money to buy the cakes. Um, so if you'd like to do that, it's in Newsweek, as in all the other um, things that are there. So we'd, uh, 267 would be very grateful to help them with that. And you'll notice on the table there, uh, the notice has changed. The sign-up sheet is not the one that was there last week. It's a new one. And that's because we're doing big lunch again, three days, Tuesday the 29th of August, Wednesday the 30th, and Thursday the 31st of August. And we know that they will only work the big lunch if we all volunteer. So you might not be able to do every day, you might be able to just do one. So if you were able to sign up, that would be really great. And then uh, those in the team will know how to organise things. So that is Amanda, Graham, Joe and Shannon. So if you want to know any more about it, just ask them. Now, some of you might have seen some folk creeping in. <laughs> Creep away. And we welcome Caroline, Michael and Jane. Have you done anything since we saw you at 8.30? We've had said and changed him. All oh, right. Tried to make him okay for this moment. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> He's a gorgeous little boy. And uh, do you want to say something, Caroline or Michael? Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, thank you so much for being the incredible church that we know you are. We have been incredibly held by prayer and food has been phenomenal. Um, but just thank you. We're, we're absolutely delighted. We're shocked. We're tired. We're overjoyed. Everything that you would completely expect. But um, more than anything, we praise God for you and him and family. So, yeah, thank you for being the church that we already knew that you were. Meet your new family. <laughs> so we'd like to pray for you. And Alan and uh, Sarah are going to come on the blind. Uh, Father God, we thank you so much for this family and for the plans that you have had laid for them and for the arrival of James. We are overjoyed um, and we pray that you will bless them um, in this whirlwind of a time um, through everything that they're going through. Uh, we pray that you will be with them, you'll be close to them, that you will bless and protect their home and them, and that they will come to know you in a new way uh, through the start of parenthood. And we pray for James, that he will know you from the word go and that he will be surrounded by your voice um, and that you will guide us as their church family. Um, in how to walk with them um, through the incredible adventures that they have ahead of them. Yes, Father, just thank you for little James. Just thank you for the safe delivery. And Father, just as they become a family, I just pray that we will become a family for them as well, to support and help them through these years as, 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 as James grows. So Father, just bless them richly now, I pray. Amen. Got to tell us he's here. <laughs> so let's pray before we have our coffee. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all that you've given us. And Lord, we hand the rest of today into your hands. And we hand the rest of the week into your hands. And we hand our family and our friends into your hands. Thank you, Lord, that you love us and care for us. Be with us now as we have coffee and fellowship one with another and we pray for safe travelling mercies as we go home. In Jesus' name, amen. Bye-bye, life. Those at home, enjoy your coffee and uh, bless you all and enjoy yours. Amen. <laughs>